Praise God. Welcome this morning to Beacon of Hope Ministries in Clearwater, Florida. And we are glad you are with us on Facebook, which will go to YouTube also, to our YouTube channel. Um, we are going to be announcing in the next week or two that we will be live on YouTube. So um, we'll wait on that announcement, but we're working on it today. We're coming together with all the, the things we have to do. Our YouTube channel is capital letters, B-O-H-M, stands for Beacon of Hope Ministries, Space Global. So check that out. We've got a lot of teachings, our Wednesday night Bible studies, which start at 6. And we are finishing up this week a series, maybe next week, on Jonah. And then we're going to go to the book of Esther. I'm pretty excited about that, teaching that on Wednesday night. So um, you can catch those live on Facebook. Also, and they go right onto our YouTube channel too, thanks to Madeline over here. So, First Samuel chapter sixteen. We're in a series called. Y'all remember what it's called? Practicing His Presence. Okay. And today's title is Heart Checkup Time. Um, any of you have a checkup lately on your heart, physically, perhaps? Yeah, a couple of you have, right? Well, God wants us to have a spiritual checkup today. Y'all ready for that? Let's Amen. do it. So let's go to 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said to Samuel, last couple of weeks we talked about little Samuel. Remember, he was uh, he grew up in the priesthood as living in the temple with Eli. Remember all that? If you missed the last couple Sundays, go to our website. I mean, go to our, no, go to our YouTube channel, capital B-O-H-M slash or space global and catch those today Samuel is a grown up prophet and Samuel goes and says to God how long will you grieve chapter 16 of 1 Samuel verse 1 for Saul when I have rejected him as king over Israel God says this to Samuel I'll get it straight here in a minute God says hey are you going to grieve over Saul why because Saul was the first king, right? But Saul totally messed up in so many ways. And God finally said, you're done. You're done. I'm going to appoint a new king. All right. Yeah, a new king. And so he says, here's what God told Samuel to do in verse 1. Fill your horn with oil and go. Now, we have a little vial of anointing oil up here. And there's a reason why we do, and you'll understand that as we go through this sermon, okay? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to where? Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I've chosen a king for myself among his sons. God had a plan. Did you know he always has a plan? Yeah. You may not know what tomorrow looks like for you, but you know what? He's already got it laid out. Because it says in Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, the plans to bless you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, like 14, 11 through 14. I know the plans I have for you. God knows. He's got the plan laid out. It's our it's our responsibility to get on board with the plan. Would y'all agree with that? Amen. Okay, when you go to the airport, it's your responsibility to find yourself up to the right gate and get on when they call the passengers up. And if you just said, well, nobody called, you know, I didn't know I was supposed to go up. Yeah, no, we all know that if we're going to fly somewhere, it's our responsibility to get ourselves there, right? right. Get on the plane, right. go to where we're going, personal responsibility. All through the word of God, God says, I'm teaching you personal responsibility. You have responsibility for your own spiritual life. I can't make you do the things that you need to do. I can't make you, as your pastor, say, how many, how many chapters did you read this week? No. It's not my problem. It's not my responsibility. Personal responsibility. Okay, everybody got that? Yeah. Okay, so he sends uh, Samuel to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. Well, Samuel says, I don't know about that. You know, people, if Saul finds out I've gone to, to anoint a new king, he might kill me. God says, don't worry about it. I got that. He tells him how to handle it. That's right. And so he goes to Bethlehem. Who else was born in Bethlehem? Jesus. Oh. See so you why? Because Jesus comes from the line of David. Yeah. Comes from the line of David, right? So Samuel obeys God and he gives him a plan. I won't go through the plan of how you're going to get Jesse and his sons to the, the meeting. And but he does. And so then then God says to him, All right, what you're going to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be king. 
Well, Jesse just have to have a whole lot of sons. So the first one in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 16 that comes in is the oldest. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Eliab. Is that it, PJ? Eliab, the eldest son. And Samuel thought, oh, surely the God's anointed is standing right here. This must be the one. Have you ever said, heard people say, oh, well, this guy's got to be a preacher. Look how he dresses. Or look how he, you know, handles himself. Or she, or whatever. Usually they don't say she. They usually say he. Look how he looks. Right? But um, anyway, Eliab, and the Lord says to Samuel in verse 7 of 1 Samuel 16, do not look at his outward appearance or at the height of his stature. Eliab was a good looking guy, evidently. And he was tall. And so Samuel just absolutely thought, oh, this must be God's anointed, right? Because I have rejected him. Ah. Oh, for the Lord sees, I'm in verse 7, can you see that? Yeah. The Lord sees not as man sees. Amen. That's right. Do y'all know that? Yeah. For man looks at the outward appearance. How many of us are guilty of that? Amen. But yes. the Lord looks at the heart. I think as humans, we tend to look at the outward appearance much more than the heart. We find out the heart. After we marry him. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> but generally speaking, I'm not talking from personal experience, of course. Of course, of course. Of course not. <laughs> but from, from the outward appearance, people can deceive you. Yeah, they can. That's right. Amen. And you can say, oh, that must be a person of God. Because look how cute they are. Right? But the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And Jesse had seven sons. This is verse 10. Passed before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, uh, mm, getting a no here. No, not this one. No, this guy's really cute, but no. Because the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, wait a minute. Something right here. You told me to go to Bethlehem. You told me to anoint one of Jesse's sons as the next son of his or the next king of Israel. And yet all of Jesse's sons have come in here and every one God you going, mm, no. Nope. No. No. Keep going, keep going. Samuel says to Jesse, Are all your sons here? Right. Right. And he goes, Oh, well, there's that one insignificant little guy. That run of the litter. That one that's out taking care of the sheep. That one. Samuel says, well, I think you better send word and bring him in. Because we're not going to sit down and eat dinner until he comes in. Angel, we might have to move one of those antennas. We're getting a little bit of static. So, verse 12. Yeah. So Jesse sent word and brought him in. Now, let's, let's hear the description of David. <laughs> now, he had a ruddy complexion. I'm in the Amplified Bible. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what a ruddy complexion is, but some people think he was a ginger. Oh, yeah. a, a ginger, okay? You all know what I mean by ginger? Yeah. Kind of red hair and, you know, freckles and all that. With beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. Have you ever been struck by somebody's eyes before? Yeah. Yes. They're just like, whoa, look at those eyes. I told you last week in the sermon that first, my first grandbaby, Rylan, that I held in my arms 27 years ago, when she opened her eyes and looked at me there in the delivery room where we all still were, her eyes were beautiful saltwater blue. And they just went all through me. And I said to everybody, look at her eyes. Now she's produced three children who all have those same eyes, which is pretty cool. But, I mean, eyes can tell you a lot, right? Yeah, Sometimes people look at you and you go, oh, my gosh, they can look right through me. There's something about those eyes, right? Well, David's eyes, and he had a handsome appearance. And the Lord said to Samuel, arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is the one. Okay? 
Then Samuel took the horn of oil. Now, wait a minute. What did Samuel do? The horn of oil. Oil always, always represents God's anointing, his presence. Okay? Somebody, somebody may say, why do you guys, when you pray over people, go get that little bottle of oil? Because it is scriptural to do that. The oil represents the presence of God. Right? Okay? And um, so look at what he did. So he said, anoint him, for this is he. He took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And what happened when he anointed him? Whoa, the Spirit of the Lord. I'm in verse 13. Came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and left Whoa, we're going to leave Samuel and David right there for now. Okay? The oil was symbolic of God's presence. Okay? When people say to you, I think that's a little weird that sometimes you guys will like lay hands on people and you'll pray over them and then you'll put oil on them. Mm, yeah, it's not weird. It's scriptural. And I'm going to go back and give you the scripture where it is. Huh? Connie will bathe you in it. Yes, you will. Sometimes, yes, you will. Uh, in James, wasn't going there, but I'm going there right now because it's coming to my mind. In James chapter 5, verse 14, it says this. Let's start with verse 13, okay? Is anyone among you suffering? Now, James wrote this. It is part of the scripture. Is any among you suffering? Any of you have been suffering at all? Okay? What do you do? He must pray. And is anyone joyful? He should sing praises to God. What have we been doing today? We've been singing songs about joy. We've been praising God because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah 8.10, right? Verse 14 of James 5 says this. Is any among you sick? Now, don't condemn someone if they're sick. We live in human bodies. Guess what? We get sick. We have problems. We have issues. That's part of life. Okay? Is any among you sick? Here's what you do. He must call for the elders or the spiritual leaders of the church, and they are to pray over him. And then, comma, here's the rest of that sentence. This is verse 14 of James 5. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. See you, Becky. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Except if you live in the 21st century. Don't do it then. No. Well, no. Doesn't say that? No. Anointing him with oil. Now, our title today is Heart Checkup Time. Okay, we're going to get back. You're going to see why here in a minute. Verse 15. And the prayer, this is James 5. The prayer of faith will restore. Restore. Now, guys, this is free. I'm just throwing this in here right now. This does not say, and the prayer of faith will immediately heal that person. No. No. That's not scriptural. No. It says it will restore. Right. Sometimes it takes a while. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have to go through medical procedures. Uh, I believe for years, 20-some years, that my knee, how many times did you guys pray for my right knee through the years mm -hmm. when I could barely walk? Millions. Millions. Yeah, Connie's right. And finally, it got so bad this summer that I was not able to walk. My kids happened to be there, and that was great. And they said, you're going to the doctor. You're doing it. We're not we're sick of it. You can't climb the steps when you come to our house. We're, not, we're tired of this. You can't play ball like you used to. You're right. You're right. You're right. I did. Didn't expect to hear. I expected just to, oh, you just need a quarter to shut up. But instead, I got, you have a knee replacement necessary. Like now, you have no cartilage. Oh, okay. So I said, no, that's all right. I've lived with it this long. That's fine. I'll just be fine. I went home, and I felt like God said to me, really, do you want to live with it? You haven't been able to do some things you like to do. The next day, I called the nurse and the doctor. I said, you know what? Would you schedule me as soon as you can? She goes, I already did, because I could tell that you were going to come back and tell us you were ready to do this. I said, oh, well, thanks. She goes, I got an appointment for you. August 16th, that's when it's happening. Okay, great. Okay? And he restored me. 
I'm standing here today, yes. right? Amen. Gone yes. through some rough days, but I'm standing. Yes. Yes. And my grandkids Woo. are saying, when you come the next time, can we play baseball? Yes, yes. we can. Sure. <laughs> really, Nina? Yes, we can. He restores the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Yes. And now we are going to John. Go back in, and if you're following along, John chapter 9. Okay? <laughs> You say, what does this have to do with your heart? You'll see. You'll see. John chapter 9, verse 1. Let's, get up, let's go to Jesus' days now. While he was passing by, he noticed a man who had been blind from birth. Remember this? Yeah. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Do you know what Christians do? They condemn other Christians for being sick or having a knee replacement. Yeah, they do. Sure do. Did you know that? Yeah, oh, well, you should have just had enough faith there, sister. They do it. They do it. And they say, oh, well, I don't know. And then something happens to them. They go, oh, yeah, well, I'm in the hospital. Yeah, really? Really? Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he would be born blind. They were trying to pin, pin his condition on somebody. Guys, we live in a fallen world. Did you know there's sickness? There's disease? There are knee injuries? Started with a football injury, by the way, many years ago. And it, guys, these things happen, right? Jesus said, wait a minute. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed and illustrated in him. Woo! Jesus oh, said, yeah. this is what happened. People, don't take condemnation from the devil that you're not as much of a Christian as somebody else because you've got a physical problem. Uh-uh. Things happen. Maybe we'll understand it when we get to heaven, but right now, guys, we can't understand that. Sometimes we have emotional, mental things. And we go, why am I struggling with this? Okay? And Jesus is saying, don't look for who sinned, whether it's the parents or whoever. Get your eyes off of that. Get your eyes on God and what he can do in you through this season that you're going through. Right? We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Another one, Jesus said, hey, I'm going to deal with this. You know, I can, I, I'm here. Let's deal with it. Verse 5, John chapter 9. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Mm -hmm. I'm in the Amplified, so it says here, giving guidance through my word and works. How do you learn to grow up in God? You have to spend time in the word, guys. You have to. Okay, And you have to look at the things God did and look at the things he's doing all around you. Do you know anybody who's been touched by God this week? Do you know anybody who's had a miracle? We've had a couple of miracles this week. Mm -hmm. Snowbird's a miracle. Yes, she, yes, she She's is. a miracle. And we thank God for that, right? That she was found, Pat's bird. I mean, golly, that's been something else. But God, but God, God. right? Verse 6, when he had said this, here's what he did. When he had said this, he said, oh, wait a minute, I got to... Bring me the uh, high priestly robe here, and let me put that on. Jesus, oh, give me the, the shawl, put that on. Make sure I'm dressed perfectly right. I have a shirt on today with bananas all over it, because I'm going bananas, right? Rachel goes, I knew you were. Yes, I knew you need help. It's not about what you wear. It's not about what you wear. It's not about what degrees you have or don't have. It's not about how successful you've been in life or how many divorces you've been through or any of that, guys. He says right here, here's what Jesus did. He spit. In the Amplified, it says spat. So the past tense of spit is spat. Did y'all know that? Yes. He spat on the ground. My gosh, Jesus, he spit? Really? And he made mud with his saliva. Oh, my gosh. Most of us would go, that's not healthy. That's not healthy. Right? Okay? Mm -hmm. And he spread the mud like an ointment. 
on the man's eyes. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Sometimes as humans, we need to see something and make contact with that. Y'all see what I'm saying? When we lay hands on you and the Lord directs to anoint you with oil, that is symbolic of his presence, right? Here Jesus didn't have any oil with him, but he did have a spit. And what did he do? He made a little concoction of mud. Now that sounds so un uh, professional. That sounds so wrong to do that. And Jesus says, I'm going to show you that there's a contact here. Why do we, when, when people say, I need prayer, we'll take their hand and we'll anoint them with oil. Or we'll come up behind them and lay their, our hands on them. Why? Because we're told in the word to lay hands, right? Yeah. It's a contact. It's a point of contact. Jesus didn't have any oil around. He didn't have any priestly garments. It was just him. In his old robe and his old thing he wore, right? Probably hadn't had a shower for a day or two or more. But he takes what he had. What do you have? What do you have? I'm not suggesting that you go spit on somebody. No. But I am suggesting that you take what you have. What do you have? The Spirit of God within yes. you. You have the Spirit of God within you. And some of you are so insecure to use it. <laughs> Guys, it's time for that to go. Amen. It's time to let go of the inferiority and the insecurity that keeps us going, oh, I'm not going to go pray for her. because, Well, and you hear God saying, you know what? You're supposed to go pray for man today. No, not me. Man, no, not man, no. Not man, no. You ever been there, guys? I've been there. I've been there many times. I questioned yeah. years and years ago. I questioned. Oh, I don't know, God, about this. <laughs> right? When God tells you to step out, we need to step out. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, for sure. Now, He probably will not tell you to spit on somebody. <laughs> 1992, I was in Honduras, in Roatan, and uh, they had flown me in to preach to pastors. It was a pastor's training thing. And a little tiny airplane, we had to put the gas underneath our seat. That was, like, really scary. But anyway, and we landed on a cow pasture. I just told this story to a couple people recently. We landed on a cow pasture, and uh, they had to push the cows away by the, the plane, you know, you know, getting close, and the cows left and we got down there, and we started having all these meetings and training these pastors, okay? And then after that little week was over, we went into an other villages with the missionary there. There was three of us going. Women. All three of us were women. So we go to this one little village, and there were so many people that wanted to come to church that they moved everything, these instruments, musical instruments, out. And it was all dirt roads. Okay, so there was a four-way stop, but it wasn't a stop. Everybody just did whatever. And it was just dirt roads, right? So they moved everything outside, the little piano and everything. And I preached with a little flashlight and preached the word that night out there in Spanish. Da, da, da. Okay, and then the pastor says to me, okay, we prepared inside the church a place to pray for people instead of out here in the dirt, which was nice. Okay, he says, come on in. So we went in the church. And now they're lined up out the door down the street to be prayed for, right? They had put palm branches, because oh, it's Honduras. They put oh, palm branches, Lord. kind of like this, all over oh, the floor. Oh, they, it was just a dirt floor, but they wanted to make it nice, yes. right, for the people. Well, as they came in and we started laying hands on them, they're falling all over the place, right? Uh, now they're laying on those palm branches, and God is healing this one and that one. And I have part of this on a VHS tape a long time ago. But the guy came that was blind. He was actually blind, guys. He was blind. He couldn't see. And the pastor whispered at me and said, this guy's blind. And he's just looking kind of weird. So I said, okay, well, no, nothing's too big for God. I've seen this with my own eyes, guys. I laid hands on him. The pastor did. Other people around him laid hands on him. He went down in the spirit. Okay, he's laying on this floor. Pretty soon, we go on praying for people. We hear this yell. This whoop, this yell. He sits up 
And he starts saying in Spanish, Yo puedo ver, yo puedo ver, I can see, I can see. Guys, I have seen that. Was it anything special? No. No. We had preached the word, and now he's laying on a dirt floor on a palm branch, and God honored his word. Guys, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about any of us. It's about believing. It's about faith. Believing that God can use you, yeah. maybe in some weird circumstances, but our heart needs to be right. Yeah. right. right. Amen. 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 Our checkup time? Yeah. Yeah. I don't tell you that story so you can say, oh, pastor, pray over somebody. And they, got, they were healed of their blindness. Oh, Watch, well, just a big old praise God. That's what it is. It's not a, oh, I can't believe this. She did. No, it's not me. I didn't do anything. I was simply the vessel putting my hands on him, praying in Spanish, and the pastor and all these other people. I don't know where the anointing came from. I just know, I know it all came from God. I don't know which person that laid their hands on this guy. I just know the guy came up seeing, praise yeah, God. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Guys, it's not about our abilities or our inadequacies. Yeah. You can write that down. Take that to the bank. It is not about what you can do or what you can't do. It's not about you feeling inferior. Not about you feeling insecure. It's about you faith. just stepping out faith. in faith. 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 I think the story's here so people could see. Look at verse 7. He said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. Oh, yes. Sent. <laughs> and he sent him away. He went away and washed, and he came back seeing do you notice what happened here? This man had to have an act of obedience. You see? When we lay hands on people and pray for them, sometimes we anoint them with oil, sometimes we don't. We don't always do that. But when God says to do that, we obey. Yeah. Now, the person being prayed for sometimes is standing there going, nothing's going to happen to me, nothing's going to happen to me. Okay, well then that's good. You're, nothing's going to happen to you. Sometimes God heals people regardless of our nasty attitude. Yeah. Right? Sometimes God heals us when we really don't, eh, I wish it wouldn't single me out. Why did she call me up to pray for me? You know? <laughs> right here, within a few weeks of being in this room three and a half years ago, Edgar, some of you know Edgar. He came up for prayer. He had never done anything like that before in his life. He didn't grow up like that. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm gonna say. It's before I had a pulpit and just had this little stool and I'm standing here and we start to lay hands on him. I didn't get my hands on him. He went down in the spirit. He was laying out there. We were going, oh wow, okay. That's God doing it. Guys, it's not us, it's not about us. Here's our heart checkup, okay? Now we're going to another place. So let's go to, um, where do I want to take you next? Okay, let me just give you two verses so you can write them down and you don't, I'll just quote them to you. The first one is, is Isaiah 10, 27. And it says this, the anointing breaks the yoke. Yeah. Okay, Amen. the anointing yeah. breaks the yoke. Yes. What is the yoke? The yoke is bondage that we all have. Yeah. We all have bondage in our hearts and our minds. All of us grew up with not the same parents, right? You don't have any siblings sitting here. Well, no, there you go. There you go. There's a mother-daughter right there. But for most people in the room, we didn't grow up with, with these same people, right? We're different. We're all different. Okay? So how you grew up on a topic of being prayed for is probably very different than somebody sitting near you. Okay? But what a lot of us did grow up with was insecurity and inferiority. You say, why are you saying that? Because we'll never step out and be all God wants us to be if we hang on to our insecurities. Amen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Our inferiorities are the things that make us feel like we're less than. We're not as good as somebody else. We're not as cute. Hey, it wasn't all the cute, handsome guys of Jesse's sons that were selected. It was the red of the litter. Yeah, David. History says he was a pretty small guy. He wasn't a big guy. But you know what? Saul, King Saul tried to kill David. Do you know how many times? 
21 times. And the anointing of God protected him all those times. And Saul never was able to, to kill David 21 times. And the reason we sang Psalm 3 today, besides the fact that that's Connie's favorite song, you're my glory hunter of my head. David wrote that in Psalm 3. He wrote Psalm 3 when his own son Absalom was trying to kill David and take the kingdom away from him so he could become king. He had a bad heart. Absalom had a heart, not after God. Absalom had a heart after Absalom. Okay? Mm -mm -mm. The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing is his presence. It's not just a drop, a drop of oil. That just represents it. Do you know what the anointing is? It's his presence. Is his presence so strong in each of us that people know there's something different about us? That's what it should be. What is it about her? What is it about him? I don't know. There's something. You know what that something is? It's the presence of Almighty God. Woo! That's Isaiah 10, 27. That the, that the yoke is broken because of the anointing. Okay? And then, let's go to Psalm 16. Let's go there a minute. And while you're finding Psalm 16, I want to quote you Acts 10, 38. Acts 10, 38 says this. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how he walked about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because the anointing of God was on him. And that's what happened. That's what Acts 10, 38 says. Now you know of Jesus of Nazareth. He went about doing good because the anointing of God was all over him. Okay? That is the presence of God. Okay? Oh, look at Psalm 16, verse 7. Now, you say, how do I stir up that anointing? How do I stir up the presence? Because when I got saved, I asked Jesus to come in my heart. Does that mean he's in there? Yes. Does he leave because you've had a bad day? No. Okay? When you ask Jesus to come in your heart, he's there. Right? What happens is life happens to us, right? Okay? And then we get discouraged and we think, oh, I'm just not doing what I should do, so I'm just not going to try. I'm just not going to try. God can't use me. I got this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. Do you know what? God can use us regardless of the problems we have. Amen. Amen. That's right. God really spoke to my pastor heart this week and said, the people have got to give up their insecurities because I want to use them. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to walk up here and lay hands on somebody. It just means somebody in, you're going to touch somebody's life in some way. Who knows? Or it means you're going to wake up in the middle of the night and start praying for this one or that one. We don't know. We don't get to choose how God's going to use us. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he comes in. But you know what he's looking for in us? A heart that says, use me. Use me. I think too many Christians, this is just my own observation all these years, too many Christians are content to just sit in a chair. That's for sure. Right, amen. Sure. Come in, do nothing, sing a few songs, maybe raise your hands. Walk out, what was the sermon about? Mm, not sure. <laughs> well, now with you two, yeah, you can be sure if you forgot it. But, but you know what? We as humans, we're distracted all the time. Okay, I know some of you use your phones for scripture, and if you weren't doing that, and I thought you were just watching some video, I'd say let's have a little talk after church. Yeah, have a little talk with the pastor, because you are in right now. We are in a sacred moment yes, right. where God is here. Yeah, man. He's not walked away from any of you, any of us. No matter what we've gone through, he's not walked away. He's not said, ah, you know, I'll just let them figure it out. No, he's always there to give us guidance and wisdom to help us get through our hard times. To give us strength when we're going through battles like Connie and Angel have been going through. Those are serious battles, guys. Yes. 
Madeline's been going through a lot. A lot of you have been going through some things. Pat just did. I mean, we're all going through things that are hard. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But guys, God is right there to help you through it. But our hearts so often go, I can do it myself. I got to figure it out. I'll be fine. I don't need to ask for prayer. Boy, there's strength when people pray for you. Did you know that? Yes, there is. Yes. There's strength when you yes. allow yourself to be prayed for. Ooh. Jesus. Okay, Psalm 16. I'm going to try to wrap this up, but don't quote me on that. Verse 7. I will keep, I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Do you know what God wants to do? Our hearts are shaped by what's going on in our heads. Did you know that? Rarely is your heart shaped by your need. No. Your heart gets shaped by things that happen to you around and how you react to those things. So your heart, the part that belongs to Jesus, grows and get stronger in the word and everything if you are putting good into your heart, right? Right, right? That's right. Remember the old commercials for Wonder Bread? That dates me. I know it. I know it. <laughs> Wonder Bread, you know? Yeah, we right? Do. Wonder Bread. Mm -hmm. They still have Wonder Bread, by the way. Yeah, yeah. they do. The back. That was like, build your body 12 ways or whatever. They never really said what those were, but something like that, yeah. you know? Okay. What we put into us, garbage in, garbage out, yeah. right? Yes. right? Counselors back there in the back, <laughs> counselors, wouldn't you agree with me? You put a bunch of garbage into your mind, it's going to seep into your heart, and your heart's going to get bitter. Have you ever heard people that get bitter? Yeah. You know why? Because life has cost, that's cost them because perhaps something happened that was really bad they could never forgive or they could not let go of. And so what happens? That turns into resentment, which turns into bitterness. Yeah. And where does it lodge? It lodges in your heart. heart. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you're not saved. Okay? It means you're bitter. Right. But it can change your behavior and the way you look at people and other things. You say, oh, I don't, I don't mind. People, I don't want to go to church. There's just a bunch of hypocrites. Yes, of course we are. That's who we are. We're human. We're all hypocritical in our own ways, right? right. We don't want to be, but we are. Guys, when people tell you that, say, yeah, come on. Come on. All the hypocrites are welcome over here. Uh -huh. Right? Because a lot, we're not perfect. None of us are. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Did you know that God wants to counsel you? Yeah. Indeed, my heart, my mind instructs me in the night. God can wake you up and give you a scripture that just absolutely goes, whoa, and that just resonates in you. You can be instructed in the night. Yeah. I have set the Lord continually before me. Here's what you have to do, guys. You're going to change your heart. Our checkup time. If God says, go lay hands on this one, I doubt he'll say for you to spit and make mud. But Jesus did that. I doubt if he would do that. But he might say to your heart, did you know so-and-so that was sitting over there? Do you remember their face? Yeah. I want you to pray for them today. Why do you know their name? It doesn't matter. Do you know their face? Yeah. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Even when life is bringing us the worst possible scenarios. Not to pick on those two. They're going through some really tough scenarios. Yes. Even when life brings some things we don't understand and we ask why. Okay? Let's go back to Samuel. He didn't think he would be anointing this little sheep shepherd that's out in the out in the hills. He thought he would be anointing a certain person that looked a certain way. And a lot of times we think, oh, well, I want the pastor to pray over me. Mm. You know what my goal is? To get to the point that you're all so comfortable praying over each other yeah. that I'm sitting here watching and going, those are my kids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I want you all to get strong. Strong in the Lord. My son, Mark, my youngest law professor, 
He's all been about the laws, like graduate of Notre Dame, of the honors, all that stuff. He's been a professor for a while, practiced law for a while. But lately, Jehovah God <laughs> has been moving on Mark McAllister's heart. Right. And he says, been calling, Mom, I'm supposed to teach the word, not just law. What's that mean, Mom? Well, that means that God will open an opportunity for you to teach the Word. He even called me a few months ago. He said, can I teach a Wednesday night Bible study at Beacon, like over Zoom? Sure you can. Sure you can. Okay. All right. Kind of went off hold. I thought, just let's just see what's going on here. Three or four, mm, two months ago, let's say two months ago, they have in their church, which is the First Baptist Church in Myrtle Beach, and it's just an amazing church. It's really cool. They have all kinds of things going on, but they have a lot of after church gatherings every Sunday. People are divided up into home groups oh. after church. What do they discuss? The sermon, which I think is a great idea. Have any of you ever gotten together to discuss my sermon? So that's a great idea. Anyway, I'm teasing you. But that's what they do at this church. Well, as it turned out, the home group they assigned Mark and Candy to happened to be in their own neighborhood. Yeah. Okay? So now, they go to this home group, and they realize it's two streets over, right? Wow. All of a sudden, now they have a whole new set of friends. They have this whole thing going on, right? So the time comes about mm, eight weeks ago or nine weeks ago. The pastor calls and says, the guy that's supposed to lead your home group this week can't do it. Could you do it? He said, I got thinking, maybe you'd be okay to do that. Mark said, I'd love to do that. The opportunity presents itself. He didn't say, oh, well, I'm a law professor. Didn't you know that? I, I don't teach the Bible. No, see, God had already prepared his heart. Did you hear this, church? Yeah. God had already been preparing his heart. Some of you right now are thinking, Pastor, you're speaking to me. Yes, I am. Okay? Because God goes ahead and works and prepares our hearts. Amen. David's little heart was prepared on the mountainside with his sheep. David wrote Psalm 16 where we are right now. Yeah. So Mark leads that group and he calls me and he goes, Mom, it was like, wow. I, I, I just, I just, I just felt alive. <laughs> I felt alive, son, really? He goes, I don't feel that way in my classrooms. I said, this guy's are teaching the boring law. I mean, come on. <laughs> Employment law. I mean, how exciting is that? He goes, no, but for me, it always has been. But And he's, he's written so many articles. He's been cited by all kinds of attorneys across the United States in his publications, he's been successful. So a couple weeks after that, pastor called me and goes, I heard so many good reports. Would you like to teach a Bible study on Wednesday night? Amen. I'm going to have to wrap this up. And he said, yes, I would. He said, oh, I thought you would probably say you didn't have time. He goes, no, I have time. <laughs> this Wednesday night coming up is number five in a series of six that he's teaching on the character of God. He's been talking about compassion. This week he's teaching about God who is slow to anger. Yeah. Now, this will be interesting. Can't wait to hear this. Okay? But he has come alive in a new way. Yeah, he loves his job. It supports his family. But he's doing the call that God put in his heart. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, that's what happened to David. David went from just being a little shepherd on the hillside who was writing songs. These psalms are mostly David. A lot of them are David. Yeah. This one, Psalm 16, David wrote. Psalm 3, when Absalom was trying to kill him. These are things that came out of David's heart. Why? Because he had a heart that had had a checkup, and he was after God, everything that God wanted for him. Y'all follow that? Yeah. I'm going to read a couple verses and we're going to close. Verse 8. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I'll not be shaken. Amen. When you put God right there, yeah. okay, God, help me here. Yeah. Give me direction. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory, my innermost self rejoices. My body, too, will dwell confidently in safety. So when you put God right there, you put him, and you say, God, do a checkup on my heart. We're going to do a song in a few minutes, Create in Me a Clean Heart. That's David's words from Psalm 51 after he had sinned with Bathsheba. Yeah. And he got his heart straightened out after he messed up. Are we going to mess up? Yeah. yeah. 
Do we have a Redeemer who's already taken it yes. all? Yes. And all we have to do is ask him to forgive us. Yes. Dear ones out there in Facebook land, if there's any of you that are not sure of your salvation or any people in the room or on Zoom, if you are not sure about your relationship with God, we give you this opportunity right now. All you have to do is repeat these words after me and accept him as your Lord and Savior. Pastor Jim, you're going to repeat each phrase. Dear God, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. Dear God, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God, Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God, Jesus. I believe that you went to the cross for my sins and sicknesses. I believe that you went to the cross for my sins and sicknesses. Mm. I believe that God raised you from the dead. I believe that God raised you from the dead. I ask you to forgive me now for anything and everything. I ask you to forgive me now for anything and everything that I've ever said or done. That I've ever said that was or not done. Pleasing to you. That, that was not pleasing to you. I invite you to come and live in me. I invite you to come and live in me. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. This I pray. This I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to hear from you. If you didn't pray that prayer and you're already saved, of course, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we have a way to reach us easily. Betty, Pastor Jim will answer emails that are prayers at bohmglobal.com. We have a radio show every Sunday afternoon, now in our 16th year, uh, 3 p.m., and it's open YouTube, and just go to Tan Talk, I get in the Tan, Tan Talk Radio slash live. You'll be right in there in the radio station with us. And uh, this has been the Beaconites here in Clearwater, Florida, and Pastor Marsha bringing you the word today. Hope you'll join us again next week. Share this post. That would be great. God bless you.